This is the I'm Possible Project Show, where we interview real people who have achieved incredible feats in the face of overwhelming odds, showing that impossible is just the state of mind and that anything is possible. I'm your host, Joshua Rivedal. Today, in episode 10, A Thread Unraveling, I talk to Monica Reagan. Let's jump right in. Monica Reagan, who is a friend of mine, uh, and Monica is an MA and an LPC. Maybe she'll tell you what those letters mean. And she graduated from Southeast Missouri State University in 2005 with a Master of Arts in Community Counseling. She worked as a community support worker, crisis worker, assessor, and therapist while achieving her license. Ladies and gentlemen, she did it all. Monica became a licensed professional counselor in 2007. She currently supervises a team of community support workers and is the QMHP for the Integrated Treatment for Co-Occurring Disorders program. I don't know what QMHP stands for, but it sounds really cool. Monica is passionate about suicide prevention, out of the darkness walks, and advocating for mental health awareness. And she also lives in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, which is home of the littlest airport in the world, I think. Maybe not. But Monica, it's so good to have you on the show. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on the show. Yes. Yes. I think we have the smallest airport in the world. Okay, that might be the micro machines town. So, Monica, you are way more than that. Like, I don't know, 75, 80 word bio. You're more than a QMHP you are a PIMP when it comes to mental health and suicide prevention. Tell us a little bit about your life. Give us a little background. Absolutely. I'll explain some of those abbreviations later. We have a lot of abbreviations in the mental health field, <laughs> and everybody does. So you kind of need like a little, your own little dictionary from every state on, you know, all that stuff because it sounds like German when you're reading it. It sounded <laughs> awful. But anyways, I grew up in a in a small town in southeast Missouri, kind of down in the boot hills. And I had a perfectly normal childhood growing up. Mom and dad were married. I have a brother, close family, you know, pretty, pretty normal, quote, unquote, life growing up. Nothing major happened. And then I went to college, had a lot of fun, decided I liked psychology stuff. And graduated with psychology degree, although I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do with it. I thought maybe I wanted to be a doctor, so I thought, well, I'll go to school and I'll, I'll become a, a psychiatrist. After getting my master's, I realized I didn't want to go to school anymore because as much fun as it was, uh, I was kind of done with school at the moment. Grad school was a lot. During that time, my dad went to prison, and it was really hard on my mom. They had been together since my mom was 14 and my dad was 19, so they had been like best friends and you know, each other's families were like their own and stuff. So that was kind of like the first time where my life just hit a roadblock majorly. And I started dealing with depression during that time. It lasted for a few months. Uh, I kind of worked on my little wellness and kind of brought myself out of uh, a pretty deep depression there. Kept furthering my career, um, finished grad school, Dad was released, and our family was back together, and it seemed like things were going really, really good. And then all of a sudden, my mom had a sudden death. She was 52. She was my best friend. It rocked my world, turned it upside down. And that's kind of when my own journey of dealing with mental health started. I thought, you know, I'd been to college and, and got my master's degree, and I got my LPC which is a licensed professional counselor. And I really didn't have a freaking clue what mental health was about. And so you talk about lived experience a lot. And I think lived experience is an amazing storytelling way to talk about mental health, to reduce the stigma and to get our own stories out there. Because learning about it in school and going through the books and the quizzes and all that crap is just kind of BS. I mean, you learn, like, the fundamentals and stuff, but you don't really know what somebody goes through in, until you've been there. And so I kind of think that's what kind of started it with me. Since I worked at Community Counseling Center, I worked here for 11 years, and we're a community mental health agency. I've really been involved with our Suicide Prevention and Awareness Conference and our Co-Occurring Disorders Program, 
So working with clients, I have a substance use diagnosis and a mental health diagnosis. While doing that, I've become really good friends with Rick Strait and Heather Williams. And the three of us have kind of gone on this journey together of discussing our own mental illnesses, our own struggles, kind of, you know, being there for each other, working the suicide prevention conferences, out of darkness walks, and, and doing what we can in our own community. So that's kind of where I am now. Still working at Community Counseling Center. I'm still working on all those awareness projects that I, I want to work on. I'm married, and we are trying to adopt. So for now, I have a dog, Ashton. She's a little pity. She's nine. And I have a rescue cat who is two, and his name's KK. I know, it's kind of me in a nutshell. All right. I like that nutshell. It's a good nutshell. It's uh, it's a very <laughs> vast and diverse nutshell. There's so much juicy material there, uh, and it's just your life. And you said nobody can really understand unless they've gone through something. And that generally seems to be true. And I think the reason why we have this kind of a thing, this podcast, this interview, I'm talking to you, I'm talking to others, why you do what you do is because it is difficult to empathize with somebody when you haven't gone through it, especially in the, in the world of mental health. And I'm just kind of riffing on what you said, because before I was diagnosed with depression, before I lost my dad to suicide, <laughs> Uh, eight years ago, back in 2009, I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. Uh, lived experience, mental, I mean, these were just words that were, that shouldn't even been connected together. I don't even, I didn't know what they were. And so the reason why you do what you do and what I do, what I do is because I, I want people to, and you want, we want people to empathize with our stories and what we've been through and not just us, but other people. So your daughter comes to you, or your son comes to you, uncle, mom, cousin, I'm dealing with a, a dep- you know, depression, mental illness, whatever. I'm thinking about suicide. And that person hopefully will not be shunned because, yeah, they, the, the, person, the person on the other, right, the person on the other line or, or, or the dad, the mom, whoever is counseling or with that person, maybe they haven't been through it, but they heard this podcast. They heard Monica. They went to the, to the Cape Girardeau, you know, to the suicide prevention conference, the Southeast Missouri suicide prevention conference. I mean, there's, you know, we do what we do to raise awareness, you know, to, to, uh, to decrease stigma. And I, I just, we met at the conference a couple about a year and a half ago and we just can, you know, we just clicked and connected immediately. And I think we have very similar MOs and there's things about our story and our stories that are similar, but I'm actually curious about because I'm going to stop talking in a minute because I've gone on way too long at this point. But uh, I, I want to hear a little <laughs> bit more about because I'm, I'm interviewing you. I'm not interviewing myself, <laughs> damn it. Um, I'm segueing. I'm a long segueer. So I, this particular project, the Impossible Project, I'm curious about obstacles, overcoming obstacles, and how people overcome them because that, to me, is the way that the next generation, the next round, how they're going to overcome what they got to go through. So what? tell us about a big obstacle in your life that you've had to overcome, and how did you do it? Well, like anybody, I've had several obstacles in my life, and the main one I kind of talk about is my mom's death, because that's when my anxiety started. And I really just kind of pushed it to the side my anxiety and thought, I'll just, you know, medicate myself and things will be fine. And the longer it went on, I realized, okay, I'm a licensed counselor. I know the signs and symptoms and I know what I teach people, but I'm not doing it myself. So what I started, I started practicing what I preach actually. And so I started doing some self-care. I started using coping skills and things that I I tell our, our clients all the time to use and, you know, that the medications do help if you take them like you're supposed to. So I I started on a regimen of medications and I started talking to people. That was really scary for me. I mean, you would think here I am in the mental health field and I tell people and talk about it all the time, but it's different when you're looking at yourself in the mirror. So I tried all these different things and realized half that crap didn't work for me. So I had to kind of think outside the box and figure out what did work for me. I'm still using those coping skills. I'm still learning new ones. I've learned to talk about my anxiety and to where I'm calm enough to talk about it and and freely share my story with other people. And I think that in itself, like you said, the lived experience is so much more than just having empathy for somebody or something that you read in the book. You had this like physician heal thyself moment. 
I can relate to that. You know, I do that sometimes. So I'm like, oh, pre- make sure you're practicing self care. Make sure you're taking care of yourself. And guess who's not doing right? that? This guy. Me. <laughs> no. So I know, and it's so hard to kind of get on a routine and a schedule, and then stop taking care of yourself. And they're like, oh crap, you know, I've been eating poorly. I've been drinking more sodas or smoking or whatever. And you realize your anxiety has kind of gotten out of control or your depression or whatever it is that people are struggling with. And then you're like, okay, I have to take a step back and look in the mirror and focus on myself again. But it's so hard. We all stay so busy. You know, you have to make it a priority in your life. You do. You really do. And, and, and that's so interesting that you're saying that because I'm kind of going through something, a little bit something right now and nothing crazy, but what I found and I guess my wants, my desire kind of going through this is when I start to feel better, that doesn't mean I, ha- I get to stop doing the things that made me feel good in the first place. And you, you said it, we get busy. We, we have this, we got that. We're trying to adopt, you know, the fur baby just had another fur baby. I don't know. I mean, there's so many <laughs> reasons why things come up and happen. And, and there's so many excuses for us to drop the ball on our self-care. And, and, and I was going to ask you, do you find that when you do drop off with your coping skills and your self-care, does your mental illness, does your anxiety exacerbate? Does it blow up a little bit? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I can, I can only remember a few times right after my mom passed away that I had true panic attacks. I mean, there are some times where my anxiety gets really, really high, but I haven't had any more panic attacks since the initial um, you know, few months after her passing. But yes, absolutely. When I'm not taking care of myself and I just kind of let it all go crap, I, I definitely am not sleeping well. My heart's racing. You know, I get all those symptoms. And I'm like, oh, geez, okay, Monica, take care of yourself, go for a walk, drink some more water, and listen to your music, and do all those things that I know I should be doing that I slack from doing. And, and, and in nowhere in that statement did you say, feel bad about yourself or mope because you haven't been doing what you've been supposed to be doing, just take action, right? Absolutely. I dig that, because it's wasted motion, because I, 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 that's it me. Is. You can't just have a, I mean, I, I don't have time for pity parties on myself, so... No, you just, you have to go. You have to start fresh tomorrow and, mm. and let tomorrow, let yesterday be yesterday. And, and there's, you mentioned panic attacks. Metaphorically speaking, if at all, or if you could just describe it in a few sentences, what the hell is a panic attack like? Because I know some people have heard about it and, and it's one of those things like I'm so OCD or she's so bipolar. Or people mislabel these things. So could you at all just, just enlighten us a little bit? Absolutely. I all of a sudden couldn't breathe. I couldn't catch my breath as much as I was trying to. I was sweating and shaking, and it felt like my heart was coming out of my chest, and I thought I was having a heart attack. And I sat, and I, I looked at my friend, and I leaned over to try to catch some breath, and that didn't work. And then all of a sudden, I couldn't see anything. You know, kind of the world went fuzzy, and I couldn't hear what she was saying. But I remember her standing there in front of me, just looking at me and being present with me and helping me to breathe on my own. I mean, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Yes, my anxiety gets really high a lot of times, but I understand what you're saying, that you can't just just say you're having a panic attack because it is so scary. If you've ever had a heart attack, I would say it's very similar. I've never had a heart attack, but I would assume it, it is very similar. And... It is not fun. So I don't want to have one again. And I hope people that, that truly do have panic attacks, you know, get the help that they need. It's, it's freaky. That, I, I've heard those things. Uh, I've experienced a panic attack once myself. And uh, I'd probably describe it very similarly. Looking in retrospect, like if I was looking at myself, it, it was almost like that cartoon moment of like, uh, Pepe Le Pew falling in love and his heart's just pounding out of his chest. Yeah, like, I know. Um, <laughs> I'm not in love, but I'm scared as hell. <laughs> what are we right? going to do about this? How did you, how did you come down off of that, by the way? I'm curious. I was lucky that I was actually on a walk with my best friend. We had passed the hospital when my mom had passed away. And mm. so I guess that was kind of the onset um, of the panic attack. But she just, she sat there and, and I just remember looking at her eyes and her 
breathing, and I started focusing on my breathing with her, and that's what helped. I mean, had I been by myself or someplace else, I have no idea what would have happened. So it's always good when you're in those instances to have, I mean, not that you can understand when you're going to have a panic attack, but that was the most vulnerable time of my life right after my mom passed. So it was good that even though I didn't know what I needed at the moment, I had those positive people and, and supports around me that knew what I needed even when I didn't. It's well, just the fact that you had a support system in general. Uh, we need that for anything and everything. We all need support systems. Absolutely, and you have to talk to them. You can't. And you it's can't. Okay. You gotta use like, it. I've learned that I'm not a burden to people. That that's my support system for a reason. They lean on me, and I've learned to lean on them too. So when I'm having those bad days or a meltdown moment, and I just need to to cry, that you know they're going to be there for me. Yeah, it's it's reciprocal. And and even if right. those people rely on somebody else for their support and not you, you could still pay it forward to somebody else. It's not about paying somebody back or I'm a burden. No. <laughs> I always say think about how ready, willing, and able somebody is to help you. They don't they don't the, the last thing to think about is, oh, this person's a burden or whatever. So definitely, right. you know, reach out to your right. support system. I think that's why people don't sometimes, just because they feel like they're gonna be a burden, but you, you go to different people for different things. You know, if I needed yes. help moving, I would go to one person. If I need help with uh, taking care of my fur babies for a weekend, I'd go to a different person. So you just kind of, we just delegate, you know, to, to help with our own needs a lot of times. And that's okay. Yeah, that's more than okay. The, 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 the you know, the office of the president. I don't want to speak about the president and him or herself, but... The office of the president has a bunch of different cabinet members and a bunch of different people to delegate to. I mean, there's no way that a person could run a country of 300 and I can't remember what it is, 350 or 390 or something like 390 million. Uh, right. That's a lot of people. And so we let's say we have that amount of synapses firing in our brains. We need people. We need a cabinet. You need your delegation. You need your parliament, whatever. I have eight people underneath me and I still delegate. So... <laughs> I like that. I, I need to borrow a couple of your team members, please. You can pay them, though. For sure. <laughs> so with, with your anxiety and panic attacks, this question might seem a little counterintuitive, but I, I'm asking you for a reason. How has that changed your life for the better? I think it goes back to kind of what I said previously. It, it's helped me be more compassionate with people and not just from what I learned in school. The lived experience and being able to tell my own story has enabled me to help individuals sometimes because I actually do understand what they're going through. And to me, that has made me a better clinician and enabled me to help whether it's other staff or clients or people in the community or my family because I'm freely talking about it and I'm letting them know how I overcame my obstacles and that I'm still okay and I'm still here doing it day in, day out that they can do the same thing too. You can be trained as much as you want, but I still go back to that lived experience is is what's going to help you engage and build that rapport with people in general, whether you're at Walmart or in a psychiatric hospital. So true. The fact that you've been able to live through this and survive, not just survive, but thrive, you're, you're able to give back. I mean, you've totally flipped it on your end and and giving, giving gifts, giving is, is, that's what we want to do. It's how, it's how we want to live our lives. It's, uh, and that's what you're doing. You're giving a gift. Every time you open your mouth about what you've been through, you've made impossible into I'm possible. You've made a lemon into lemonade. You've turned a liability <laughs> into an asset. And that's incredible. That's in part what this show is about. Whether it's contrived or accidental, those are the people that I really hang out with. And you're one of those people whenever the hell I go to Missouri, uh, which yeah, no kidding. might be... Well, hopefully it'll be a little more frequent, but I'm never home either. <laughs> the Midwest Cape, is in the middle of nothing. Cape Girardeau. Love it. I like the way you um, kind of reframed and reflected to use some counseling terms here, what oh, I had thanks. just said initially too. So I definitely like turning your asset, liability into an asset, and then women into a lemonade. I'm going refra- to reframe here a little bit too and be a counselor. So what I'm hearing is, I'm kidding, I'm not going to do that. Um <laughs> 
Stop to reframe, it. to reframe, to reframe. That doesn't work. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's all about having these conversations. You talk about that all the time. You talk yeah. about storytelling. You talk about lived experience. You talk about reducing stigma. You talk about making the impossible possible. And that's all we're trying to do, too. We're just trying yeah. to be regular people, yep. having conversations. Yep. And, and somebody, I think this is crossing into cliche territory, but... Normal is a setting on the washing machine. Like, who the hell knows what normal is? But I'll tell you what, there's two people on this call right now who are talking to each other who some might say, maybe 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago, might say, these two people are crazy as hell, and we need to put them in some kind of institution, and they can't do this and they can't do that. Well, guess what? Guess what? We're both, we both have good marriages. We both work in a good field. We both are able to travel. We both have... You know, I, I got stepkids, 13, 15, they're my kids, so they're my kids. And you got fur baby, uh-huh. and you're about to have a kid at some point. Like, we're doing our thing. Like, we're, like, quote-unquote normal or whatever. Or Right. And, we're still living that, the dream. That, yeah, hell yeah. And so what I'm saying is it's okay to be a little bit weird. It's okay to have flaws and quote-unquote defects because that's what makes you human. That's what makes you normal. And, in fact, you could use that defect and turn it into an asset, into a characteristic, yeah, yeah. you know? That's what you're doing. Part of who we are. It's Mm -hmm. it's not the entirety of who I am or Mm -hmm. you or anybody else. It is a piece of us. And when people start understanding that and start relating, whether it's substance use or uh, a mental health diagnosis to the same thing as diabetes or blood pressure, then I think the world's really going to change. I think so, too. But it starts with simple conversations like you and I are having. I think so. I think so. And and the more that we talk about this and the more that we hear it and the more that we have more lighthearted conversations about stuff like this, too. I mean, I understand when you're when you're talking about, you know, the intervention aspect of of a, you know, a panic attack or anxiety, somebody's going through it. There's no joking around. But you and I, we could have a lighthearted conversation and, and talk pop culture or whatever and then jump right back into anxiety. I think we need to have more of these conversations. Fun it doesn't have to be completely serious. There's no. no script that says this has to be, you know, that has to be very adult language and professional and appropriate at all times. Screw that. <laughs> yeah. No. And you know what? The the commercial for this show, if we end up doing doing like you know something on YouTube, it's not going to be storm clouds and balloons, helium balloons popping, and a sad looking face. I don't know what it's going to sure. be, but it's not going to be that. Rainbows and unicorns, white chocolate. You knows it. By the way, listeners, I had in high school been called white chocolate. That's why she called me that. Just, just filling everyone in. It was, a, it was a very bright and um, amazing time in my life. And nobody calls me that anymore, uh, except for Monica exactly. and my Saint, my, my my Cape Girardeau friends. So we're here in this quick fire round. We're doing this a little quick fire round. This is a little fun. Hopefully, we have a little fun here. This is my uh, inside the actor student, uh, inside the actor studio moment. Um, so I'm just gonna ask you some fun, quick questions, and just whatever comes to mind comes to mind. What is your favorite word? Word. Word. Uh, y'all. Y'all. That's a contraction. I like it. Why apostrophe? Shut it. You ask me this weird question. I'm. I'm gonna keep asking you some weird questions. What is your least favorite word? I don't have one. Make one, make one up. <laughs> you don't have to. Skimmer rinky dinky do. Oh, skimmer rinky dinky dink. Yeah, I remember that word. That was from my childhood. Uh-huh. What is your spirit animal, Monica? Oh, a ladybug. A ladybug. That's so cute. Okay, two more. What are you terrible okay. at? Mm, taking care of myself. <laughs> no. Okay, fair enough. I thought you were going to say I'm terrible at not caring. <laughs> Quitting smoking? I don't know. <laughs> you could have said the Macarena. You could have said, you know, like anything. It. Last one. Last one. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say to you as you enter or if you get kicked out? Uh, when I enter, he's going to say, welcome, child. And he's going to point me to my mom. Oh, I like that. And you'll see your mama. That's <laughs> I bet you get some interesting answers for that one. Uh, so far, so far, I've I've heard I've heard people just say, "Welcome, come on in." I haven't heard anyone say, <laughs> "Like you're not welcome, get out." Still waiting for that one. <laughs> it's everyone get thinks the they're boot. getting in. You get the boot. I might get a boot. I don't. I might have to live in a boot for a while. That, that's my somebody. punishment. That's my purgatory. I mean, somebody. Not you, but I'm oh. saying somebody might say that. Oh, I- 
I was just playing along. Um, <laughs> so kind of winding down, what are you working on right now that's got you like excited, stoked? Or what are you working on or what will you be working on? A project or it could be life, it could be work, it could be anything. What, what's going on in your world that you're excited about, that you're stoked about, that you want to tell us about? Yeah. And by the way, I love how the longer that we've talked, you have gotten the Southern draw just by talking to me. I'm impressionable. I can't help it. <laughs> you, you are. <laughs> um, so a couple of things in my life. We're still working on the adoption. It's been a year in. We just met with our worker. Typically, people will uh, adopt babies within 12 to 18 months. So we're hopeful that we're right on track with that. So that's like the best thing, hopefully, that will be happening this year that we're still working on. And then work-wise, I'm starting a new position, which I'm really excited about. I'll be working, kind of going back to my roots, going back to um, helping people and, and hooking them up with services and stuff and getting out into the communities again. So I'm really looking forward to that. I think there's a lot of good change in the air and and it's time. But I'm going to keep doing my thing. I'm going to keep working with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, Out of Darkness Walk, and, of course, our annual Suicide Prevention and Awareness Conference. That's kind of me. And you got a lot of stuff going on. I think you you got a book coming out, too, don't you? Am I uh, wrong or I right? I do. Hey. The Iron Possible Project 2. That's right. The Impossible Project with 2. With Josh Rivadal. Oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. check out my girl, Heather Williams. She mm-hmm. has a story in there about her eating disorder. Mm-hmm. That's my boo, one of my BFFs. So yep. you definitely have to get the book. You definitely have to check out our stories and, and give Josh some props because he's doing some amazing things out there. It's supposed to be about me. But I got to give you some props, too, because <laughs> without meeting you and... And doing all these, you know, wonderful things together, we wouldn't be sitting here talking together. So much sure. less to you, honey. Yeah, I'm so glad that I'm so glad that 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 we know each other. I'm I'm grateful for our friendship. You know, I don't know. I, I, I'm going to speak for our listeners on the, on this end and say we're pulling for you on that adoption. Um, it's going to go down. It's going to happen. And you're going to be a great mama. And your husband's going to be a great daddy. And here's my southern draw again. And, um, uh-huh. I hear it coming you out. know, and, um, <laughs> so Monica, thank you so very much. What if, what if people want to get in touch with you, uh, or they, they love your story. They, they want to have you speak somewhere. They want to consult, whatever, like, what, is there a good way to get in touch with you? If at all? Um, Facebook, I don't really tweet that much. No worries. No worries. Snapchat, but I don't really know how to use it yet. So um, nobody try to get in touch I, with Monica. Don't try. Don't do it. <laughs> my Facebook page. I don't even know what my Facebook page is. I like, don't Monica know. Reagan. Okay. All right. Well, if anybody wants to get in touch with Monica, you can holler at me or you can comment on the show notes or iTunes or Stitcher or what have you. Or you and, can buy uh, the book. The or I you can buy book. the book. You could buy the Impossible Project book number two, and then you could really get yeah. to know Monica and see how bomb.com she is. You've been listening to The I'm Possible Project Show with Joshua Rivetall and guest Monica Reagan. I love sharing stories and how to turn impossible into I'm possible. If you want more inspirational stories, our second and third books are in pre-order right now. Changing Minds, Breaking Stigma, Achieving the Impossible, as well as Lemonade Stand. Both contain powerful stories of overcoming tremendous odds. When life gives you lemons, squeeze, add sugar, and pick up a copy of The I'm Possible Project. www.iampossibleproject.com slash pre-order. Thank you so much for tuning in. You're more than a community. You're part of the I'm Possible family. Until next time, sending you lots of love. <laughs>